Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. For 56 years, Basic Black has been covering the issues that impact the lives and livelihoods of communities of color. And for more than 10 of those years, I've had the honor of leading conversations about wide ranging topics from the legacy of the first black American president to COVID's disproportionate impact on people of color, mental health challenges, as well as economic and voting disparities. Included in the mix, inspirational stories of firsts in every field. The artistic contributions of musicians, painters, authors, and filmmakers, especially the film exploring representation, family, and legacy, which became a global phenomenon. This is my last show as host of the program. More details on that later in the show. But tonight, I'm looking back at a few of the memorable episodes during my tenure as host with a particular focus on ongoing issues and topics that continue to be relevant today. Joining me this evening, Renee Graham, associate editor and opinion columnist, the Boston Globe's op-ed page. Kim McLaren, professor and interim dean, graduate and professional studies at Emerson College. And Philip Martin, senior investigative reporter, GBH News Center for investigative reporting. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's glad to have the old gang back together what? again. <laughs> well, I want to start off with probably the thing that nobody expected to happen did happen. And then after it happened, we got some would say predictable response, and that was the election of America's first black president, Barack Hussein Obama. Mm. Now, during this 2017 episode about President Obama's legacy, the discussion looked at the former president's thoughts on racism. Take a look. One of the most important parts of his speech this past week was him talking about the the, the fact that people are fighting each other and while while huge corporations become richer and richer. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a Marxist uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the point of the, he was making was that this divide and conquer uh, aspects of American society, which, again, he also addressed in the 2008 speech, he sees that as the fundamental problem. He sees race relations as emanating from that, but, but it's almost secondary. This is how, and, and so I think we have to, it was inferred that uh, President Obama, Barack Obama, was a post-racial president. He never said that, of course. And he right. corrected it. He yeah, corrected that. He, corrected he, he right. has always seen, he's seen himself, he sees ra racism in, in re uh, realistic terms. Not like Martin Luther King saw racism, which was far more stark, not like Malcolm X saw racism, because they did not see it as a universal problem. Uh, it is a universal problem, but they saw they saw what, what, they, what they looked for yeah. was specific solutions, prescriptions, yeah. and what Barack, Barack Obama seeks are universal prescriptions. But what, he's, to but race, what he suggests is that the weight yeah. for the, the weight for fixing them falls equally on black people and white people. Precisely, that's yes. not right. No, no it's, well, it's, it's problematic. Yeah. It's, it's problematic. It's, but not, I, but, it's not problematic. Right. It's, it's wrong. just wrong. So, Kim, we can, we'll let you pick up from there because there are many legacies of yeah. the uh, President Barack's um, presidency. I mean, I'll just note that, as many others have, that Black Lives Matter actually came to be during the time of his presidency, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it almost seems like the exact opposite of what some would have hoped would have happened with regard to an easing of race relations when the exact... <laughs> The other end of the spectrum. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear myself saying that back then. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I was wrong. I yeah. think I was right. That mm -hmm. that, and I think, I'm, and sadly, I've been proven right that um, Barack Obama, you know, we, he was a wonderful president. Well, well, he was a good president. Mm -hmm. Let me say that. Um, he had some many failings, and this was a fundamental one that I think he just misread the nature of white supremacy and the and how deeply embedded it is in the American society. And unfortunately, I think that's been proven correct. Right. So um, this this backlash was as predictable as it is violent and enduring. And that's it is it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Philip, have you changed uh, where you were coming from? Well, at no, the time? I, think, I think Barack Obama, it, I'm. Barack Obama's analysis was that you have to have universal prescriptions. The problem with the universal prescription is for racism, as we see with the Supreme Court's recent uh, decisions on affirmative action, is that they're 
problematic. They don't work. They have they don't address uh, the racial problem. So I guess I wasn't so much as defending Barack Obama, but trying to describe what his solution was, what he see, saw as, 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 as a solution, which is a notion of a universal dis, uh, prescription to racism. That is to say, a prescription that uh, that helps all people. Well, that, the problem is you see bigots now uh, invoking the name Martin Luther King and his words to try to to, to try to uh, to address their uh, feelings of victimhood. Uh, and so, yes, I thought Barack Obama, uh, Obama's <laughs> context of universal uh, prescriptions is is wrong. It's uh, and I think uh, uh, Kim is correct in that sense. Uh, I was defending Barack Obama, of Wait, course. Let's okay, say I was correct. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, you are correct. Yeah. I was, def- I was uh, of course, yeah, trying to you. define what Barack Obama was mm-hmm. attempting to do, but mm-hmm. Barack Obama, in this sense, was wrong, and he should have paid greater attention uh, to the uh, the extraordinary level of racial animus that was uh, percolating in this country that has come to a head, as we see right now in this in this nation, Renee. where people are coming out of the, out of the woodworks. Yeah. I mean, just to pick up on that point that Phil made, I, I think that was a shortcoming of the Obama presidency and, and perhaps Barack Obama himself. He, he could not, he wasn't prepared for the backlash. And so when the backlash came, he didn't necessarily know exactly how he should address it because he was still trying to figure out a way to talk about racism, but not to offend white people. Right. And you can't do both of those things. You can't be worried about who gets offended by it. And I think he went too far in that direction, trying to figure out ways of talking about what's happening in a company, country, of talking about, say, Trayvon Martin's death. But you heard the backlash when he said, Trayvon Martin could have been my son. Right. And people got upset by that. Why were they upset? It was true. But that was the thing. He tried to thread the needle and missed, I think, far too many times. He needed to confront it more directly than he was able to do. I would also say with the Trayvon Martin example, uh, it was a clear reminder that I am a black person in this right. role. Right, which is what people didn't necessarily want to hear. Yeah, yeah. Right. and right. That, you know, right. for a lot of people, it was like, oh, right, he is a black person, and mm-hmm. he's identifying with some of the ongoing struggles of black people whose son could have been right. Trayvon Martin. And at once any he time. acknowledges being a black person, mm-hmm. then they have to acknowledge they have a black president, and right. that made them very, very upset. And they yeah. have to acknowledge the existence of whiteness, which is, right, which is right. the main thing that they don't want to, don't want to um, acknowledge, and, and, and white been, supremacy. That's mm-hmm. right, and it should have been clear as a result of the Skip Gates, the uh, right. Henry Louis yeah, Gates episode with the police too. officer in yeah. Cambridge. Right. That should have been... Um, a lot, but that was sort of a pre uh, uh, precursor. That's right mm-hmm. to right. What, what we saw. Right. That's okay. right. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we thought we had experienced a racial reckoning um, it was during the time of COVID. To add um, a lot to the episode, and this is George Floyd's murder, mm-hmm. and his on-camera murder shook the world. And our discussion of his death and its aftermath won a regional Emmy Award. The American Psychological Association noted Floyd's death concretized a racial pandemic that could harm African-Americans as much as COVID-19. And this excerpt features both Kim and Renee answering my question about how they were doing emotionally. I will be frank. I have been alternating between numbness and um almost resignation because I know I personally have been writing and talking and all of us have been writing and talking and begging and pleading about this for decades. And of course, our people have been doing it since uh, since uh, David Walker, right, in 17, uh, I'm, I'm going to, um, 1831. And before that, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass, F- uh, Phyllis Wheatley, right? This is nothing new. Every, every time we have to reawaken white America. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I tilt between rage and exhaustion. You know, yesterday during George Floyd's funeral, at, literally at the same time, Senator Rand Paul was on the floor of the Senate lecturing Kam- Kamala Harris and Cory Booker about lynching and why it would not meet the standard of being a federal hate crime. Like, that's where we are in America. And so I, yesterday I just felt exhausted. I just felt completely worn out, you know, and that's what it has felt like in some ways through, you know, through the beginning of this pandemic, because, you know, as a journalist, you don't get to step away from it. You're writing about it, but it's also happening to you. So I want to begin this part of our response to that episode 
by saying there were a lot of pledges made, a lot of promises made, uh, both corporate and individuals. We're going to do better. We want to learn better. We want to listen, all of that. Um, and some of those pledges have, frankly, been reneged on. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as though this period of time that uh, got people going to the street mm. around the world, not just here in America. It was so such a stark response to looking at this this vicious murder in the broad daylight um, on camera. But here we are, Renee. Here we are. You know, the whole idea of racial reckoning, I never really bought into it. This country does not reckon with race. And so the idea that even watching George Floyd's slow, agonizing murder under a cop's knee was going to change anything, I, I was just never convinced. And it didn't. What you had were corporations sort of throwing crumbs. We can do this. So when you ask for, you know, changes in boardrooms, what you got was Aunt Jemima off the box, off the mm. pancake box, mm. you know, which suddenly it occurs to them, well, that's something we can quickly do that's not going to really harm us. But what did it really change? And that's mm. what we got. We got the, it, it's almost, it, they were rolling a rock uphill and at some point went, we're done. And the rock rolled right back to where it was, which it always was going to do because they were never going to make the emotional psychological or financial investment in changing these systems of racism in America. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the most powerful episodes. I remember very clearly you asking me, you know, it's going to be different this time. You know, white white kids are in the street. And I remember very clearly saying white kids have been in the street before. Right. In the 1960s and in, in the civil rights movement, there were mm -hmm. white allies um, and saying, no, it's not going to be any difference. The, if you look at the cyclical nature of progress, black progress and violent white backlash in this society, this was always, as Renee said, just going to be another cycle because it does this this country refuse uses to reckon with the, the basis of white supremacy. And it's not racism. I want to be clear. It's white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's about power. It's not about feelings. As you know, mm -hmm. Stokely Carmichael said, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If I, he has the power to lynch me, mm -hmm. that's my problem. Racism is about power. And until the, the embedded structure is willing to release that power, it will not change. Mm -hmm. Everything else will be window dressing. And we knew it would be. And what, what I think was surprising is how quickly right. it reverted. That's the only thing that surprised me was how quickly those corporations said, oh, never mind. Mm -hmm. How quickly all the promises of DEI said, oh, never mind. How quickly everybody reverted. That surprised me. I thought it would last a little bit longer, but I'm not surprised that it didn't continue. Um, what's, what I might have put on the surprise list is how fast we now have laws, actual laws on the book that said you can't even discuss exactly. history that's uncomfortable. Right. Um, and books are off the shelves because we don't want to hear about these experiences coming from a place where it, it seemed at the time everybody in the country wanted to mm -hmm. uh, have a discussion, a real discussion about it. Philip. It's still important to point out that we, you have white allies and you have BIPOC allies and probably the numbers increased after the killing of George Floyd. Having said that, the biggest problem right now, as you stated and as the, both of you have stated, is that the backlash has been ferocious. But the backlash has to be considered, uh, put in the context of systematic backlash. This is not something that is occurring or organically, uh, though some of it may be without question. But this is an organized effort to push back uh, time. Uh, we know that progress, uh, uh, there's a notion of forward progress, and, that, and we're, we, we've been seeing that uh, be, even be way before the civil rights movement. We've always uh, moved forward, but there's always an attempt to move backward. And that backwards movement is ferocious, and it does it is taking the form of laws and so on and so forth. Uh, the attacks on DEI, uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're seeing it not just in conservative communities. We're seeing it in nominally liberal communities oh, yeah. uh, because there is the threat of of, of that progress that we we've, we've been talking about. It's been enunciated in a way that's scaring people. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's assumed there's a zero sum involved. Right. If 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 you're winning, we're losing. Mm -hmm. The whole notion of corporations uh, 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 pushing backwards is not particularly surprising when you have employers and you have CEOs saying maybe we've gone too far, mm -hmm. so on and so forth, without any cognizant uh, understanding that if we are going to get to a point where we really have a pluralistic democracy in this country, it's going to have to really involve pluralism. Right. Uh, and, right. and I right. think that there's a, there's a uh, uh, I think that there's this concern that it's gone too far.
And if we think that things were per perhaps bad in 2020, we better prepare for yes. 2024. Oh, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. we are, we're experiencing a backlash that is not just systematic uh, and uh, uh, that represents the deprivation of certain rights. We're also talking about violence. Right. We're talking about gr groups that have been given a green light, Proud Boys, uh, others, yeah. so on and so forth. Uh, and and uh, neo-Nazis have come out of the woodwork up, uh, uh, demonstrating on overpasses in New Hampshire and in well, Massachusetts. I mean, attacking the United States Capitol. That's right, I mean, attacking the United right States there. Capitol, it any, exactly. It doesn't get any worse than well, that. Well, we're at the point now where mm -hmm. uh, uh, even people who are nominally speaking up, as in former Massachusetts Governor or Senator Mitt Romney, stepped down not because of age, as he said, but because he has to have a special security force right. every day with that's him right. now. Absolutely. Okay, so that's yes. that's where we are. Right, and, and yeah. librarians right. are under attack. Right. I mean, school right. teachers are under right. attack. This is, this is, this is really what's dangerous. What's happened to school boards, right. how school they've been boards. weaponized. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. All right, well, COVID was a massive uh, Im it just took a massive hit on everybody, and let's just say that, in the country and the world. Um, but it was a particular thing for us. During the height of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, communities of color suffered, suffered enormous health and economic losses. And in this clip from Race as a Health Imperative, we discuss the connection between the flu epidemic of 1918 and the 2020 coronavirus. First of all, it's it's race and racism that determines what happens in uh, epidemics. And the reason I make the distinction is that, one, racism is a public health issue in that where one works, where one lives, um, wh what kind of health care one gets um, determines health. Uh, and if you look at this historically, in the 1918 influenza epidemic, this was a, a time, and it still is, I think, very current, where there's this belief that black bodies are different, that there's something about black bodies that makes African Americans vulnerable to diseases. You saw that in 1918. But in 1918, it also was a time where this was not just the time of the influenza epidemic, it was the time of World War I, but it was also at the time of very rigorous and strenuous xenophobia and also racism. This was where during the time of Jim Crow. So you found that African Americans had to take care of themselves, that because they could not go into white hospitals, that um, that it was the black community that took care of itself. And I think we're seeing that now, that, that the black community and other communities of color are bearing the burden of trying to take care of themselves. I mean, I think she said it all. <laughs> I think she said it all. I just uh, wanted to raise that because, as you all know, the conversations that we have Often the thread is white supremacy and racism and their COVID brought it all together yeah. uh, in a way that just rested on um, communities of color. We took the brunt of it. We were the essential workers. That was it. Uh, and so I just it, it, and, and I wanted to point out that we were early on a basic black talking about these issues uh, before a lot of other folks made the racial connection to the disease. Right. So I just get that on the table. I'm going to yeah. move on because I want to I want to get another segment in before we we close here. But, you know, that's the essence of what the basic black show does that's is done. to really get mm -hmm. right to that. Um, those kinds of issues. So I want to conclude. Let's uplift. <laughs> um, uh, we were all wearing the dashikis and the earrings and being all excited uh, when uh, Black Panther came out. Uh, uh, and it, it turned into much more than I think even any of us could have anticipated. Uh, it took film goers into the world of Wakanda. That's the fictional world. The Marvel Studios film became a global hit, as I said, and a pop culture phenomenon. In this clip from our episode, Kim reflects on the African-American an African connection and our understanding of our history and ourselves.
One of the profound things about it is that in the African-African-American connection, it would have been easy for Kugler to make a movie about African, um, African-American yearning for a homeland, right? Yeah. That's our mm-hmm. story that yeah. we all know, you know, this, this romanticization of Africa mm-hmm. and this longing. And I think it was actually really brilliant to, to, look, back, to, to look back this way, too, right? We, you know, we're, we're, it would have been easy to do a story about the lost child, mm-hmm. which is what we are, and we, you know, this mm-hmm. image of ourselves as the lost child. But there was one point where Killmonger says, Maybe they were the ones that's lost. That's why they couldn't find us. Right. right? I thought that was a profound Mm -hmm. moment. Like we're both, you know, and yet we are not lost, too. When he shows his lip, he is African. We are African. So we're not lost. But they're lost. We need to find each other. Mm -hmm. It's not just about us finding our way back home, which is our which is way which is what we internalize so much. Right. We're we're not lost. Mm -hmm. We need to find each other, Mm -hmm. which is a powerful, a powerful message for our young people, because I hear a lot of young people, I don't know my history, we're lost. Mm-hmm. That is a de- devastating thing for our young people to internalize. Mm-hmm. This movie says that's not true. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. <laughs> And it is so important. That is so important that we are not lost. We are not broken. We are not dysfunctional. We are a strong, resilient, amazing people who have many, many challenges, but we are not lost. Think of everything we've been through. We're here. We are here. We're not lost. I just love the fact that Killmonger, you know, like, uh, uh, became, like, the hero of this. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, he's not the villain. He was not the villain. He yeah, was, villain. Exactly. He was right, an you know? anti-hero. Right, um, which uh, right. That was but, a Hollywood thing. He was that's not right. The that's right. But he also ultimately would have become the uh, 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 Mobuto uh, Seko, perhaps, of, uh, oh. mm-hmm. uh, of, of Africa. <laughs> because don't forget, he was also authoritarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have to think about the, um, the contradictions as we also think about those things that are going to push us forward. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it yeah. feels like it was a long, long time ago. Thank God they did uh, Wakanda forever to remind us. Um, but just that, that story about all of the connections and, you know, it was not a Marvel story. That's what, that's what everybody took from it. It was an origin story, yes, but it also had these layers of complexity about our community That's and right. our yeah. multiple legacies, yes. which really resonated outside of communities of color, by the way. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what was so tremendous about the film. Well, what, right. what was also tremendous is what was happening externally, as you, as you point out. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that we took a group of kids, of myself and others, to see this movie over in Dorchester uh, and the exhilaration of these of these kids and the costumes that they wore to uh, the uh, to the event and f- and people were it was so celebratory yeah. uh, and it was necessary uh, at that time it's it was part of the um, uh, the, the very points that uh, Kim and Renee pointed out it, it was necessary in order in order to bring out uh, I mean they had it already but it really brought out the pride in these young people uh, as it brought out pride across an entire. Uh, 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 the entire communities of right. black folk uh, and, uh, throughout the country. And the Afrofuturism yeah. element was really mm. important because mm. what Afrofuturism says is that we do have a future, right? <laughs> right? right. That we exist in the future. We, we survive, we thrive, we grow and glow. And so that was really part of it, too, is that it was it was showing us going forward and being in the future, not to mention the strong women aspect right. of it, That's which is right. also yeah, so I, can, I can remember being in an airport and seeing two black men pass each other like this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I was just like, yeah, yes. yes. You know? And that was, I mean, on one hand, it was, it was, just, but it was meaningful. It meant right. something. It meant that the movie connected with them beyond just this bit, bit, bit of entertainment. And that was important. And we need that. Oh, we absolutely need that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I dressed up. I sure did, <laughs> and took pictures outside the movie theater. And uh, we would be remiss if we didn't note there were so many talented people associated with it. But Ruth Carter, the costume designer, oh, won yeah. twice yeah. two right. Academy Awards for her designs and really connecting with uh, the African design and taking it to another place through her own creativity. Right. I mean, right. and talk that about was the storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yes, right, right. <laughs> no. and, and how authentic that was. That was important, too, the fact that she could be part of that and so it wouldn't, wasn't just typical Hollywood projection. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 
And this was worldwide, by the way. I, I mean, you got you saw, so, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. saw, you, you also saw uh, Asian kids and white kids and uh, uh, and the Latino kids, you know, dressing up yeah. in movie theaters yeah, around the country in, in the uh, in the context who, of the Black Panther. Saw themselves in that story. That's right. Well. Saw themselves in and that, that story. You know, that's what when Hollywood gets it right. Right. That's what happens. Yep. You see yourself in there, right. even if the person doesn't look exactly like you. There's a place for you. Right. That's and the right. point is that the black experience, it can be universal, just like the white experience exactly. is universal, right? Because we, mm -hmm. we inhabit everything that is human humanity, mm -hmm. right? So it can be particularly black, but also universal. Right. Well, I will note that Chadwick Boseman, he who played B Black Panther and sadly has oh. died, um, one of his great quotes is that uh, the more universal, the universal story can become very specific yes. if mm -hmm. you pay attention to right. all of the details. Right. And, um, well and he never was uh, more correct than this because right. there was no discussion of uh, why did they have this in there? Why weren't there more uh, white people in it? Why weren't they? <laughs> it was mm -hmm. just here's the story and just... You know, get into it. <laughs> it demolishes, if it needed to be demolished, the myth of colorblindness, right? Like, yeah. you know, colorblindness is not to be aspired to, mm -hmm. right? It's celebra you can celebrate unique cultures and see the universal in each of those. Well, colorblindness is blindness. Yes. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> Put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> As always, enlightening conversation from all of you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. That's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Beginning next week, you will see a number of new and some familiar faces in this host chair. They will continue the mission of Basic Black, guiding engaging discussions important to communities of color. While I am signing off here, I am not going anywhere. You can still hear me on 89.7 FM, hosting my radio program and podcast, Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, which airs on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. I'll be contributing to GBH News and co-hosting an exciting new daily radio program, The Culture Show, highlighting books, movies, and cultural trends. Hope you'll take a listen. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.